that would be great. I see Paris, Germany. I see a few Dutch people. Um, lots of returning uh, returning people here as well, which is great. Amsterdam, Brazil, Belgium. Beautiful. Well, introducing a very special guest today, uh, one of the leading wildlife photographers in the industry, a fellow Dutchman, which makes me very proud, and the only photographer to have won the Grand Slam, which is the grand titles of Wildlife Photographer of the Year, International Nature Photographer of the Year, and Travel Photographer of the Year. Marcel, it's great talking to you today. Welcome, uh, welcome in the webinar. Thank you, P. Uh, nice to be here. I'm proud to be a part of this uh, important project. Thanks a lot. I see a very, very big lion in your background. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that image, just quickly? Oh, that's like super old image that I shot uh, at the start of my career with uh, with, a, with the first digital Nikon camera that I ever bought, the D70. So it's only a six megapixel um, file, but yeah. But with a lot, with a, with a lot of meters. Huh? But with a lot of emotional connection, I believe, because it's one of your first shots. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a picture that I've ever shared on the internet because I don't think it's actually that good. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's not, that, that's why you put it so big in your own house. It's, but it's good. It's good enough for uh, for the room that it's I in. Love it. Yeah, it's I love it. Serves a purpose. Marcel, there is a lot of topics we, uh, we I would love to chat with you with you about, but we only have we're limited in time. We only have forty five minutes, uh, so let's dive right in. I have a few questions, but the audience can ask questions as well. So if you're listening now, use the chat box, uh, make it an interactive session. I can't promise I answer all questions, but I'll do my best. That's all I can do. Uh, and towards the end of the session, we will do a short Q&A as well. So I'll try to go through all the questions. Let's go, time, let's go back in time first a little bit, because I know you have a previous career in advertising. And one of the things I most appreciate in your work, and I'm sure that many people in this webinar agree, is your eye for composition. Do you think, and you can see the question coming already, that your career in advertising has in some way, or maybe in many ways, helped you in becoming kind of a master in your craft as a photographer? Um, <clears throat> yes, the, my, so my advertising uh, history has greatly, greatly influenced uh, me. And probably the most important thing it has taught me is that, uh, um, in principle, nobody ever actually asked for uh, my images. You know, I'm just making these images and I'm sharing them, but nobody has asked for them. And my images have to compete with a lot of other images. And it's the same with advertising. Uh, nobody asks for advertising. It's just there. And if you want people to notice you and also to look at your image a little bit longer than uh, a few milliseconds, then it's really important that you keep your message uh, very simple. So the more simple the message, uh, the more simple the design, the more likely it is that people will actually look at your uh, advertising. And I think the same applies to, uh, to photographs. If they're too complex, then um, people just not uh, really notice it. And it also fits my, uh, my, my character very well, the, the, clean, the cleanliness, the, 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 the simple compositions. So would you say you have like, I mean, in advertising, people say you get like one or two seconds to catch people's attention. Does that count for wildlife photography as well, for instance? Well, actually, it's a lot less than that in advertising. It's like fractions of seconds. Here we go. Uh, but um, I think in um, for us as nature photographers, I think it's more or less uh, similar, greatly depending on where, where the images are. So in a, in a magazine, uh, uh, people usually buy magazines, so they are more open to seeing what's inside. But for instance, people scrolling through their Instagram feed, uh, looking at tiny, tiny images, uh, yeah, that, that, that goes like fast, 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 fast. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult to stand out of the, the, that, um, that crowd. Yeah, uh, definitely a topic we're going to we're going to chat about later. Mm -hmm. How do you win the Grand Slam in wildlife photography? Reveal the secret. Now, but we definitely will talk about how to stand out in a crowd that is social media these days with being spoiled and flooded with content. Uh, so I save that question for later. But let's first have a look at uh, I mean, you, I, I know you're a big advocate of uh, believing that good images start at home rather than in the field. Uh, 
I know we prepared a few images, so I'll give you, uh, I'd, say, I'd say the floor is yours. We have five examples of your images in which you will explain people why you believe so much in the fact that uh, good images actually start by planning them. So let me open the presentation and then it's all yours. Yeah, so I, I selected five images that are, that are fairly well known. <clears throat> and um, uh, the, the idea is basically that I think that uh, what I do, so nature photography, um, like any other um, uh, kind of photography, it's all about creativity and ultimately about originality. There's basically two ways to uh, be original. Uh, one way is to be original by chance. And this is a good example of that. So this first image is a very old image and um, was one of my first publications in National Geographic. But um, this image is purely the result of, uh, of luck and a little bit of uh, um, uh, persistence, but mostly just luck. And the second image that I have selected is this one, is similar. So it's a very original picture like the first one. Uh, because for both of these uh, images uh, counts that there, there's no other one. So they're super original. However, for this one, the same thing applies. It's just, this is originality by chance. So I just happened to be there and this happened in front of my eyes and I just pressed the shutter at the right uh, time. So these two images, however much I like them, are not images that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, so just just, more... just just one question to interrupt you to give a bit more context maybe to people listening. So that means that, for instance, this this image it doesn't mean that you were just accidentally standing there or waiting, or were you being there for more times in a row because you knew that yes. it might happen at some stage. It's like just yes, give us the, a bit of the, context. The latter. The latter. Yeah. So the, yeah. So I, I I was there for my for my first book which was a book on uh, uh, safari lodges. And um, wh while I was there, I heard from one of the local people that uh, an elephant had been spotted uh, mm -hmm. a few times in the vicinity of the edge of the falls. And so that's when I decided to hang around a little bit longer. So we stayed a few extra days and in the end that paid off. But yeah. then still it is, it is still, it's, I mean, it's, it's not very creative to hang around mm -hmm. a little bit longer. That's that's all I want to uh, say. So this is yeah. still, for me, yeah. it's originality by chance. And also with the snow monkeys, it's the same. So I think that it gets way, way more interesting when you create images that are original because of something, uh, something you have come up with. So a, a creative yeah. concept. Yeah. And um, so if you open the next image, that is a, a very good example. Uh, this photograph I photographed at the time when all my colleagues in nature photography said that this particular place, so iconic, but it had been photographed to death. So they all said, like, there's nothing you can do there anymore. And that sort of triggered me into thinking, OK, is that really true? And what what can I do? And then I came up with this idea and then it took uh, several years to, of visits to get these circumstances where I could actually try it. And that resulted in this image. So this image is a direct result of uh, what I call pre-visualization. So it's the image that uh, I, I, I make the image in my head and then I, you know, work towards that. Yeah. And this, the second image is also a, a good example of that. So this, before I, I had ever been here, I already knew that this was going to be uh, the way that I was going to photograph it, meaning with my own light. And um, because I knew that this was going to be the only way for me to have control over the ambient light and especially to have control over the incredible amount of clutter uh, yeah. in forests. And I'm super allergic to, uh, to clutter and distractions. And as you can see, forests are mostly clutter and distractions. So I came up with this idea to shoot it like this, uh, mixing ambient light and uh, flashlight um, a, as a solution to my personal uh, aesthetic preferences. So when I arrived there, I instantly knew how I was going to photograph that. And this, 
and this is the result of that same uh, pre-visualization. So how does that work, Marcel? If you start doing your research at home, do you, do you, I mean, you know you're going to go and visit this place. You know, you know you want to create something very distinctive. So does that mean your research mainly centralizes around knowledge about animal behavior as well as researching any image that has ever been shot in that in that little space, right? So how do you do your research? What kind of variables are playing a role in that? Yeah, so the last one is most important. So I, I first, I'm always interested in what has already been photographed of the subject that I'm interested in, because that tells me if there is any openings uh, for me that I can still try. So there's just certain subjects that have been photographed so many times that it's almost impossible to photogra photograph it in a new way. Um, but, so I always start with that. And then um, based on photographs that already exist of that subject, I know um, what not to do because there's no point of reinventing the wheel. And at the same time, it shows me um, what has not yet been done. And that is the interesting part because then I can really start looking for uh, creative ideas and try to photograph something in a new way. In yeah. this particular case, obviously it was slightly different because this species was completely unknown to uh, to most people. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, it is, it's a shot that won you Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Uh, oh. That a shot that traveled the world and that came with 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 a very du a duality in the consequences of it. And I know you've been talking about this before uh, in webinars and podcasts and so on, but I think it's important to highlight the duality of an image going viral in that way, of a place that was relatively unknown to the world. Could you tell a little bit about how you, how you as a photographer look at your role when it comes to photographing unknown places in relation to giving a world stage to an image? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> when I won the title, um, I was very aware of the impact that it um, could have uh, in both a positive and a negative way. So the positive way, obviously, was that uh, for the first time, people uh, could actually see this uh, remarkable species. And um, for the first time, they would hear that this is actually an endangered species, so that it needs, uh, needs help. And I always say that uh, successful conservation starts with awareness. So that's what this image did. It uh, created awareness. So that was, a, that was a good thing. The flip side to that is that uh, there was so much awareness uh, that suddenly a lot of people all over the world, uh, photographers and non-photographers alike, um, became very interested in photographing uh, this particular species. And because it's an endangered species, they don't live in many, many places. So um, suddenly there was a huge influx of uh, tourism to the, uh, to the areas where these monkeys live, to the extent that uh, two years later, the entire reserve closed down because there was just, uh, there was just too busy, too many tourists. So th that is something that I have become increasingly aware of over the years, um, mm -hmm. that one single image can have both a very positive impact, but also a whole list of very negative ones. Yeah. And I mean, how does the role of social media in general for you tap into, uh, I mean, you've been around for a while now in the industry for, let's say, 15 to 20 years. So you've been living through a pre-social media age as well. If you compare uh, not only building a career, but also growing as an artist now versus then. So not necessarily the environmental consequences, but if you look at, I mean, Instagram has beautiful sides to it. Facebook has beautiful sides to it, but we all know the destructive, destructive power. Does that count as well for building a career if you look at how you use social media in general? Uh, oh, yeah, things have, have changed massively uh, since I started. Also, I think since you started, because you saw, you've also been uh, on Instagram yeah. for quite a while. Um, and when we started, uh, it was not as big as it is now. And I think that there's a lot of very positive sides to social media. I think it's, it's great for entertainment value. It's great for showing friends and family what you're doing. 
is also great for uh, important projects like uh, Prince for Wildlife, for instance, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a massive platform um, and it needs all the attention that it can get. So it's absolutely perfect for that. Uh, at the same time, there is also, I think, a lot of negative components to it uh, uh, as a photographer. One of them, I think, is um, mostly regarding like creativity. So if you if you realize that uh, on average, uh, people spend like two and a half hours on social media per day. And for kids, it's between five and seven and a half hours. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's an insane amount of time that people spend looking at images. And that means that uh, from a creative point of view, you're going to be influenced by what you're looking at and you're going to be influenced by it big time. So even if you're trying to uh, uh, shut off from what you're looking at, you, you will not succeed because every time you see a certain style and a certain image that's popular, it's going to... It's going to find a way in your head and it's going to stay there. And before you know it, you're going to be photographing or processing your images in ways that you have seen uh, before. So that's something we see happening on, uh, on social media uh, a lot. If you look at Instagram, for instance, you see that uh, the most uh, famous landscape or wildlife photographers uh, with the most followers, they very quickly get uh, a lot of people who are trying to emulate that style yeah so that's that's one component that i think is is not particularly good especially not for beginning photographers i th think they should be aware of that and the and the other point i think is taps in with a previous uh, uh, point about the monkeys is that when you share something on social media you have to be very aware of the uh, the consequences that your images or your story even uh, can have. So if you post something and it's going to be popular and it's going to be maybe shared by tens of thousands of people, that may mean that a lot of people are going to go to these places or are going to try going to try to do the same thing as you did, and that is it's not always good. So because of that, I've I've been quite reluctant of sharing very precise locations, for instance, of yeah. uh, places that I think are yeah. fragile ecosystems. Yeah. Well, you see lots of photographers deviating from the notion that every location should be shared. Uh, I'm sure you, you agree. But what I would love to zoom into a little bit more is uh, what you mentioned before, and that is uh, that it's really hard for, I mean, the, the, the conscious versus unconscious influence that social media has on young emerging artists right our platform is uh, is serving a lot of those young kids uh, i know there is lots and lots of aspiring uh, wildlife photographers to be following principal wildlife if you as like kind of a, a senior in the industry what would be like a word of advice uh, because being influenced in an unconscious way to me sounds like pretty scary I mean, how can what what is ways to kind of disconnect from that influence? Because maybe there is people that actually don't want to be influenced, but they still browse social media. They still go to photography exhibitions. They look at award winners. So, I mean, how can people avoid being too much influenced by that? Well, that's obviously very hard, especially because when it's subconsciously happening. Um, but I think the best way is to be very, very analytical. Uh, when it concerns your own work. So when you create your own images and when you're processing your own images, I think it's it's very good to constantly ask yourself with every little thing that you do, why am I doing this? And mm -hmm. how does this compare to uh, what the big names are doing or what my uh, my friends are doing? And I think that's a very good way to become aware of the choices that you're making. So, for instance, just one example. Um, on Instagram, um, a lot of images, when there's a blue sky in the, in the, in the image, uh, the, the, the color blue is going to be desaturated. It's going to be darkened and it's going to be more like a steel kind of blue, steel blue, I think. Mm. Uh, that's what you would call it. And clearly this is not what uh, what a natural sky looks like um it's there's nothing wrong with uh, doing that to your skies but the moment 
every single shot you see has very heavily desaturated blue skies that are uh, very different from what a normal sky looks like. Then you've got to ask yourself, okay, why is this happening? Is this, um, you know, is this like a fashionable? Um, that's mm -hmm. fine because you can just follow the fashion, but that this, you, you just need to be aware of the choices that you're making because the moment you're going to follow a fashion, then we all know that fashions never last. So yep. that means at some stage that will just have, it will prove to be have been a gimmick and then people will jump to something else. Yep. And then later when you look back at all your images, you'll see, oh, I, this is when I had this period, when I did this to my <laughs> skies. And this is when wow. I had that period, when I was oversaturating everything. You know, and I think that's the best way to uh, to look at it. So it's it's not a problem to be influenced. It it becomes a problem when you're not aware of it that it's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes me think a lot. I've been going through a few phases as well myself, <laughs> and I think many people many people have been, especially if you look at post production. So does that mean that you never go back to an image and re-edit it? Is that is that what you say? No, that's absolutely not what I say because I, every time I open an image, um, almost 90% of the time, I will change something. Mm -hmm. But it usually it, it is going to be uh, very, very small changes that most people will not notice. But I will not suddenly like change the entire look uh, yeah. unless it's like a really long time ago from a time that yeah. I didn't have a clue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, very interesting. If there's any questions in the audience, uh, this could be a good moment to post them uh, uh, in the chat box. I'll look and uh, see if I can integrate them. Uh, let's go and let's go forward to the next image, uh, Marcel. That is also essentially the image that will be shared and sold by Prince for Wildlife this year, which I'm incredibly proud of. Could you tell us a little backstory to this image and also give, give a bit more context to how you planned it before even traveling to, uh, I believe it's shot on Lower Zambezi, traveling to Zambia? Yeah, so this is not an image that I uh, created in my head at home, uh, but this is a good example of pre-visualizing in the field. Uh, so because basically what happened here, uh, we were on one of our photo tours in the Lower Zambezi and Zambia. So I was actually with uh, a group of people and we were driving around as you do on the safari. And then suddenly I saw this uh, constellation of, uh, of trees and um, I'm, in my style of photography, I'm, uh, I'm very much focused on sh uh, very graphic shapes and lines. So I immediately saw the, uh, the potential of this image. Yeah. And I then discussed with the group and I explained, like, I think it's worth actually uh, just positioning ourselves here and just wait for whatever will show up in that little area there on the left. And um, luckily they all agreed. So uh, we, put, we, we just basically waited here. And this is, this is another, I think, great example of, uh, of creativity because this image wasn't there yet. You know, it, it was just something that I saw the potential of and just waited for it to materialize. And that's, uh, that's something that I'd like to do on safaris quite a bit. So, um, the typical way of people going on safaris is let's drive and let's find an animal. Yeah. And uh, if the light is good, then we're going to stick with it. And what I usually do is something uh, a little bit different. So I like to go to uh, areas that I think are very pretty. And, and I like to photograph the, 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 those areas, those landscapes. And then I just take for granted whatever animal uh, walks into my frame. And so it's the opposite way of working. I don't go to where the animal is. I go to where, the, where I want the animal to be. Yeah. And uh, this, it's a different strategy. That is a very, very interesting approach. Uh, and I'm sure many people uh, will start trying this now they know. Uh, we can easily connect one of the questions coming in about one of your poly polar bear images, which we saw last year in Prince for Wildlife 2 which uh, I'm curious about uh, before we dive into the question. Is that an image that had a similar approach to this image? We're talking about no. one. Okay, that was just pure luck. 
luck. Yeah, that's how that's yeah. uh, where we started. Originality by chance. Yeah, I'll try to find the image uh, meanwhile. So if you just tell, I mean, the question is, then you can start answering the question, I find the image. The polar bear image that was on Prince for Wildlife last season, could you tell us a little bit about that moment and experience, please? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very typical moment, uh, like any uh, spectacular thing that happens for most wildlife photographers. Um, we are, luck plays an incredibly important role in, in our in our work uh, because we have no control over our subjects and we don't know when they're going to appear and when they are when they appear we don't know what they're going to do uh, usually they're not cooperating because they're clueless about photography so they're facing the wrong direction or doing something yeah. else that we don't want uh, so it's very rare for everything to fall into place um, and to create a perfect image extremely rare and every now and then it happens. And when it does, it's usually complete luck. And that image is the same thing. I just happened to be there, just happened to see uh, that scene. And all I had to do was point my lens at it and, um, and photograph it. And I could, I, could, I could turn it in like a very spectacular story. Like I, I waited in my, in my Zodiac uh, for, the, for days on end and I almost froze to death. <laughs> but it, um, it's, it's, it's not like that. It's just, uh, you know, it's like winning the lottery. Well, and I think it, this is something which is really important to acknowledge because uh, the whole concept of luck, which to me is the only thing that distinguishes photography from any other art form, is very, very undervalued. And I think too little people talk about the power of luck in nature and wildlife. Of course, you can plan things. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can educate yourself. You can read books. You can do all your research. You can work with the best guides in the business. But essentially, you're working with natural elements. And luck is a very, very big variable in that equation. Right? So yeah. I found, I found uh, the picture meanwhile. So let me see if I can open it. So people get a bit of context to what we've been talking about. Uh, and then meanwhile, uh, let's look at the second question. Uh, what is the top thing people, photographers and non-photographers can do to help conservation? Big question. Uh, photographers and non and let's, non let's, let's look at non-photographers yeah. maybe first. I think that's, uh, that's from, from hearing an answer from someone who spends so much time in precious ecosystems working, uh, working amongst wildlife. I think, I think it could be interesting to see uh, how you feel about it. Yeah, so for non-photographers to uh, to help with conservation, uh, there's many ways. Uh, the most obvious way is to just donate to uh, uh, conservation uh, organizations or buy prints from uh, Prints for Wildlife, for instance. Yeah. Um, another way is actually to visit parks, so um, like national parks, because the money that will generate uh, can be used to invest in the park and to maintain yeah. it, uh, et cetera. So it's very important. And that's exactly what we saw during COVID when uh, people couldn't travel. Uh, that meant that people were not visiting the parks. And immediately we saw what, uh, what was happening. Uh, poaching skyrocketed and um, mm -hmm. the, the, the lodges didn't have money anymore. Uh, the, the parks didn't have money to maintain the parks. So, um, yeah, so tourism is, is, is in many ways it's very good for conservation as long as it's uh, controlled tourism yeah. so not uh, going out of hand um, and for photographers they can use their images to share stories so like what Matt with my golden snub-nosed monkey image you can imagine that there's many more subjects uh, that require the attention of a broad audience and that can be a landscape that um, is threatened, uh, but it can and it can be species, can be a specific park, etc. So by taking photographs of them, uh, especially beautiful photographs, when you share them, they will get a lot of attention. And then I think it's important that you, as a photographer, explain um, a little bit about that photograph. So not mm -hmm. just like dump that photograph on social media and say I took this in uh, in Brazil that's not going to do much uh, but uh, so if you just take some time to uh, write a little story explain what people are looking at and explain why it's important that people realize that uh, you know something needs to be done about a certain situation then 
I think that can have a, a massive influence. Yeah, a few very good examples. I hope that answered the question. I really like the second example, uh, explaining that tourism is a very, very big engine behind conservation. That's something that is very mis mis misunderstood these days. Right? In, the, in the beginning of the pandemic, many people were arguing that the natural world finally had time to breathe again. But of course, nothing was further from the truth because tourism is absolutely funding uh, a very big share of wildlife conservation. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, another question that is coming in and that is also top of my mind uh, is about post-production, a very big topic in photography. The question is, what is your top tip and advice for amateur photographers to find their unique style of editing? And I mean, post-production, of course, is a very big share of the journey. If you talk about scratch to end product, uh, how do you look at uh, the art of editing and post-producing images? Okay, so I should start by saying that uh, in nature photography, it is um, one thing to realize is most people who photograph landscapes and wildlife, they tend to stick fairly close to uh, to reality, basically. So the way mm -hmm. that what they saw in real life, the, they try try to stick close to that with their with their photographs. If you do that, then obviously it's going to be super difficult to create something that's unique because you're sticking so close to the original. It is obviously way more uh, easy to create something that looks original when you uh, use a lot of post-processing. So the moment you use like heavy filters, um, that will be the easiest way to, uh, to cr create your own look. Um, I often compare it to, to like a... If you're a chef and you and you make a, a dish, um, the post processing processing could be like a sauce, you know. So it's like mm -hmm. a, that, that filter would be like a would be like a sauce, and um, that's that's good. But at the same thing, you should at the same time you should realize that that sauce doesn't change the essential that, that's underneath it. So the the dish itself, the the the, the meat or the fish or the chicken, is gonna that's gonna be the same uh, and um it is much better to try to be original with the with the actual dish so not the sauce so and the to, ingredients uh, to, 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 yeah, to the ingredients so to create something that is already original hmm. and then um you may not you may not need to use as much sauce to make <laughs> it really uh make it really original i like and, that analogy um, a lot if you, yeah if you go to a poor restaurant they usually use a lot of sauce <laughs> just to disguise the fact that's what underneath the sauce is actually not that good. And, and that's how poor and, photographers use a lot of filters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think so. But, but it's also tempting, you know, I understand it because yeah. um, instantly you, got this, you get a certain look. And um, if you, you don't have to spend a lot of time on Instagram to see that you're constantly being bombarded with all kinds of uh, presets. Yeah. And uh, presets are very popular because obviously uh, what you think is that they're going to be a one-click solution to your problem. Mm. Uh, you have this beautiful image and you think, how can I make it more beautiful? And then you hope that with a preset you can click on a button and then suddenly it has that magic look. And unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Uh, so you really have to do your own work. You have to uh, analyze what's out there. You probably have to make a list of all the different uh elements of photography that really appeal to you so that can be composition wise can be subject wise location wise but can also be processing and then you have to probably write down what it is that you like so much about the processing and then try to understand why it is that you like it so much and try to put that into words because the moment you know why you like things more than other things that's when you start to understand uh what your style of photography yeah. should be because your style of photography should never be the style that you think is going to be most popular yeah because then I mean, you're then you're just doing someone else's trick yeah. you need to do your own thing i couldn't agree more uh, being a photographer myself i think it's really easy to be influenced by other people's styles but as soon as what i learned over the past years is as soon as you start asking more that why question why you believe in your own work if you can convince yourself then it's much easier to convince other people and what i see happening these days is there's too many people focusing outwards how can i convince the world without convincing themselves first 
So just adding to this a uh, great answer by Marcel, I would say young and aspiring photographers try to turn inwards and find an answer to why am I shooting this topic? Why am I traveling to this country? Why am I picking up a camera in the first place? Right. So an, a question that taps into this as well. Uh, and it's also really interesting for me to learn from your side. Uh, do you, if you, I mean, some photographers, if they work in the field, they tend to think in black and white if the end product is supposed to be black and white. How do you work in the field? Is it making an image monochrome a decision you make in your office? Or is that something that happens in the field or before you even go into the field? No, I, I, I still think in color. So uh, when I'm in the field, I, I see everything in color and also see the images uh, in my head in color. And it's only afterwards when I'm uh, back in my office and I look at the results, that's usually where I decide, okay, this is, uh, okay. this is not working for me in color. And then I decide to turn it into, into black and white. It's usually for now, I've been using it usually as a, as a solution to a, to a problem. Yeah. When an image doesn't work in color. Yeah. Yeah. No. So to give you an example, give you an example. So when I've uh, when I photograph, for instance, elephants or a rhino or something, the, those those subjects are gray. They're very large and they're gray and um, big blobs basically. <laughs> and so when you photograph them in uh, with a blue sky, uh, green grass, those two colors are going to completely dominate your subject. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's gonna they're gonna be like squished between that blue and that green like a hamburger and um and i <laughs> i don't like that because i think that it's gonna that it's hugely distracting so yeah. when something like that happens in my images then um usually my first instinct is to turn it into black and white because that means that i can get rid of those uh those distractions yeah well, I mean, in the in the in the especially in the high key fine art wildlife market, you do see a lot of black and white. Uh, so gener yes. generally, you're trying to stay to stay away from that because you appreciate color too much. Is that is that how it works? I'm not like I'm not like actively trying to stay away from it because I really appreciate it. As you can see behind me, that's black and white. Yeah. But <laughs> actually, every single photograph in my house is black and white. It's just because I like my house to be like my images so very clean very graphic uh, no yeah. distractions and so that's uh yeah that's what you can also see in my in, so in my private life and i thought that just very large images in color would just be too distracting so then black yeah. and white is a very good uh so i have we have no colors in our house it's all <laughs> black white and shades of gray which is it's very comforting very uh it's, it's very <laughs> i love i love how you I love how you really to the eye. practice what you preach. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, but that, it, it does show that uh, the way that I photograph is directly connected to my character. It's, yeah. It is how I, how, how I prefer things to be. Yeah. So um, that makes total sense. And whatever, so whatever your character is and whatever your photographic style is, to me, it makes sense if those two are connected because otherwise you're basically acting a certain style instead of being being your style and that also uh, taps uh, into the whole notion that as soon as your individual personal style is connected to your creative identity i think that's when you found when you found your core in your in your work as an artist right when you're connecting your yeah. personal yeah, identity sure. with your creative identity and when i'm when looking at your work i think that's something that for sure happened on your side uh, and that many people are craving for so another question for you, uh, Marcel, uh, we have another five to 10 minutes on the clock. So if people want to ask questions, drop them in the chat box. I mean, you're not only known for your wildlife photography, but also for your nature work and your travel work, right? Which is three different realms, three different industries. Is your creative process different for each industry? Or would you say that is very generic? Uh, no, it's sort of, it sort of ov overlaps. So, um, so I, I like to, to say that um, I'm probably primarily a wildlife photographer, even though I very much like the other two also very much, so the landscape and the, and the travel photography. But my heart is really uh, the wildlife photography. Um, but 
my ideal kind of wildlife photography is actually landscape photography mm. combined with wildlife photography. So the examples that we showed earlier, uh, whether it is the polar bear image or the um, or the elephant in the forest or the elephant at the edge of Victoria Falls, those are all perfect examples of what I try to accomplish in my photography most. So that's basically a landscape image that is already very pleasing to look at. Uh, and then by having an animal in there, it really brings the landscape to life. So that's for me is the, uh, the biggest achievement that I can, uh, that I can get in, in my photography. So that's where la landscape and wildlife photography for me overlap. And also like, like to think like that because uh, landscape photography is so different from wildlife photography and vice versa, which explains why most landscape photographers, photographers don't, are not really good wildlife photographers and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. And that's totally understandable because it's it's just extremely different uh, approach to uh, to photography. But I think that if you try, uh, then it will help you to uh, do different things that you would otherwise never have tried because you're always uh, sticking to the same sort of routine. And yeah. with so as an example, I don't know if I can just blabber on or if yeah, yeah. To, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So as, as an example, go ahead, go ahead. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. So with wildlife photography, it's what the easy thing about wildlife photography very often is that um, you see the subject and you know instantly where to point the camera because you know that lion is over there. So clearly, you're going to point your lens in that direction. Yeah. Um, with landscape photography, it's completely different. You're in this beautiful <laughs> landscape, but there's not just one subject. The landscape. Yeah in its entirety is the subject so where are you going to point your lens it's very very difficult it's hard yeah. uh, hard yeah. to decide and um and and vice versa you know in landscape photography it's super easy to take the photograph in a way that um the landscape's not going to move you know it's not yeah. going to suddenly run away so yeah. you have all the time in the world you can just set up your tripod take your time and wait for sunset or sunrise and then click or uh, and return the next day if the weather was uh, not cooperative cooperative and yeah. so there's all these advantages and disadvantages or challenges in in all these different fields of uh, photography and i think if you've if you've done both of them or all three of them um you you can use the experiences from that in any of the yeah. any of the genres and it will make you, I think, a better photographer in the end. Yeah, I fully agree. Some people argue that you should bring it down to a very small niche and become an authority in that niche. But I agree what you're saying. Uh, if you can shoot more different environments and subjects, in essence, that will make you a more complete photographer in each dynamic. I couldn't yeah, agree. Yeah, well, so I, I, should, I should add, because I just heard you say it, that um, if the only thing you're interested in is um, becoming like a very strong brand and uh, uh, get, becoming famous for a certain thing, then you should definitely um, specialize in one. Okay. And then just trying to narrow it down and focus and, and maybe do on, and within that little segment, try to focus on something even smaller in there. Yeah. Because then every time you post something, People will recognize it. Oh, it's that subject. Oh, it's black and white. Oh, yeah. it's a close up. Then it must be from this person. Yeah. And uh, then you claim, then you claim something, and that's going to help you in the long run to become uh, more well known. And if you diversify, like I do, uh, you also do, then um, uh, that's going to make it harder because yeah. it means that the one time you're going to share an image that uh, will appeal to wildlife photographers, but the next image you're going to share will be a landscape image or a travel image, and it's not going to appeal at all to yeah. one yeah. one group. Yeah. So that you're going to make it harder for yourself in that way, but I think as uh, for creative personal growth, it will definitely help you becoming a better photographer. Yeah. Two um, last questions from my side, uh, unless there's another one in the chat box, which are stepping away from photography a little bit. 
Uh, one is, and that's something I love to learn from all, well, all photographers in general, what is inspiring you outside of photography? Where do you get your inspiration from if it's not photography? So, yeah, so inspiration, you can, I can see that in two ways. So um, one way I can look at inspiration is inspiration that directly influences my creative thoughts uh, regarding my, my photography. But inspiration can also be just a general uh, inspiration in the sense that I just feel creative or, you know, my brain gets triggered or, uh, and I've, it, I'm mostly interested in the last one. So I'm never really searching for inspiration within uh, my own field of work. So I generally don't, uh, look a lot at what my peers are doing. I'm also not really like focused on that. I will only look at it where, when I'm searching uh, for something, when I'm doing research, I'll look at what other people are doing. Other than that, I get most of my creative inspiration uh, from completely different things. So uh, mostly design in general. So graphic design, typography, uh, architecture. I, I love architectural renderings, especially. So uh, that I really like. And then I also get uh, inspired by music and uh, listening to philosophical debates. So those are all things that uh, tickle my brain. And I think that is basically what inspiration is. You know, it should like completely, uh, no, constantly like wake your brain up and keep it like going every now and now and then you get like a yeah. spark and that spark will make you want to uh, create or it will give you uh, different ideas. Um, but I think it's also healthy to try to get your inspiration from elsewhere, uh, apart from just only within your own field of work, because then yeah. you, I think it will become too narrow Then it's too much in your own bubble. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful answer. Thank you very much for sharing that. And my last question would be, uh, after having seen so many places in the world, what is on your list? Uh, is there a, like a dream, a dream trip, not necessarily photography wise, but is there a place in the world that really captures a certain energy that that is drawing you to it? Yeah, so I, I have a list, uh, a list of locations where I uh, still want to go or want to go back to. And um, that's a list I'm not going to share uh, because of <laughs> what so, because, of what, we, so. because <laughs> of what we uh, what we discussed earlier. Yeah, because the moment I say, "Oh, I would really love to go to, uh, yeah, yeah, to this yeah. place," <laughs> then um, a lot of people will think, "Oh, yeah, I should look into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's really cool." And um, it's not that I want to like keep it a secret for myself, but um, in a way, actually, I do because it will help obviously to um to create something that's more original than when i'm the millionth person going of to course, a certain place but also because uh there's places that i want to go and i know for a fact that those places are very rarely uh visited so if yeah. i would share that already now that would mean that yeah. already people would go there and uh, it would not benefit myself but it would also probably not benefit the locations um, that always puts me in a difficult spot because uh, you could argue that the moment I start sharing pictures from fragile ecosystems that I, I might do a lot of harm yeah. doing that. So yeah. this, is, yeah. this is always a very difficult dilemma for, uh, I think, for a lot of uh, wildlife, especially landscape photographers, yeah. because it's a lot, of, a lot of times it's very fragile ecosystems that uh, yeah. suffer the most. Yeah. Yeah, let's have a look at your polar bear image quickly before we, uh, I promised that to people and I looked it up just to give a bit of context. It's a grainy version because I took it from Google, but this is the image, oh, we, that's fine. This oh. is the image we've been previously oh. talking about. Absolutely mind blowing. It was the, the image that sold out quickest in principal wildlife history uh, last year. Oh, okay. So that's, that's a nice little, uh, nice little detail. And I'm sure people can see why. Uh, this is the image, by the way, that will be on sale this year. Uh, I'm kind of torn. I, I can't decide if I like this one or this one more. So it's great to see how quick this one will sell out this year. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Uh, thank you for the audience for joining. Uh, it was an honor talking to you. Uh, Marcel just awesome. recently published a great, amazing book called Mother, uh, which is showcasing 
I think a lifelong of uh, picture taking. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's, that's correct. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a, a 15 to 20 year document of Marshall in the field. If you haven't heard about the book, look it up. You can get it uh, in many, well, Marshall, you can tell people where to get it, but I believe it's available anywhere. We're, yeah, it should be, it should be anywhere, just um, preferably at your local bookstore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's what I tell people as well. <laughs> cool. Th thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, Lauren says, received the book yesterday, bigger than I expected, which was a very pleasant surprise. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, everybody, oh, for joining. It was a, a really great talk. I could I, I could keep keep on for, uh, for hours and hours, but I'm sure there will be somewhere along the lines we will get another opportunity to chat. Thank you, everybody. Marcel, uh, enjoy your night in South Africa. And, thank you. Uh, I thank until, you for having me. Until we meet and again. Good luck. Good luck thank with uh, Prince of Wildlife. You. Four more yeah. weeks. Four more weeks. August 28th, we're going live. Thank, thank you very much. All right. All right. See you guys.